This morning's sermon is a part two to last week. We discussed, uh, for those of you visiting with us, our, our word for 2022 is the word faithfulness. Uh, we've discussed that in many aspects of the Christian life. Last week, we talked about being faithful to the gospel, just taking a careful look at where people draw their assurance from. There are people that have a false sense of assurance that draw it from things that they are capable of accomplishing without the presence of the Holy Spirit. And then where true assurance comes from is the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Areas like, am I compelled to do the difficult things that honors God? Do I have a heartfelt desire to worship? in my spirit, to worship in spirit and in truth? Do I have an internal compelling to love the word of God and to obey its commands? Uh, Certainly having a transformation on the inside that produces evidence on the outside. And that's what we're talking about today. Not only a faithfulness to the gospel, but a faithfulness to holy living. A faithfulness to holiness. Uh, When we say holiness, the basic definition of holiness is the same definition of sanctification. It means to be set apart, to be separate from the world that we live in. And are we living faithful to become more like Jesus and less like the world? Uh, A pastor uh, that I admire much is is Vody Balkum. He has this simple prayer that he says he prays every morning. And that is, Lord, make me more like Jesus today than I was yesterday, and may I be more like him tomorrow than I was today. That is the pursuit of holiness. May I be more like Jesus today than I was yesterday, and may I be more like him tomorrow than I was today. The pursuit of holiness is the daily process of becoming more like Jesus and less like the world that we live in. Uh, We're called to live every day of our lives seeking to honor the Lord with our thoughts, with our words, and with our actions. And there are so many texts that state that, that use the language of it being a daily process. Just to read a couple of those, uh, Philippians 2 verses 12 and 13 says, Therefore, my beloved... As you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Peter echoes that same teaching in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure For if you do these things, you will never stumble. And then, my favorite verse in the New Testament, Ephesians 4.1, Paul begging of the church today to make sure their walk matches their calling. It says in Ephesians 4.1, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you have been called. So just to spend a moment on this verse, I want to define a couple of terms for you in our pursuit of holiness. The word beseech means to beg. This is the Apostle Paul begging believers to join him in a cause. And then he identifies or defines what that cause is. He says the cause is matching your daily walk with your calling. The word worthy in Ephesians 4.1 means to balance the scale. So I want you to kind of get an image in your mind right now of a scale that has a platform on the left and a platform on the right and whatever you sit on one side in order for that scale to be balanced must be equal in weight to what you sit on the other side. And so if we were to use this word in a in a practical setting, we would say a worker is worthy of his wages. What do we mean by that? That means that what he got paid today balances with the amount of work he invested. It balanced out. It was worthy of the cause. And so what do we do with holiness? We say, all right, on one side of this scale, let's put your calling as a child of God. A blood-bought, born-again believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross through his death, burial, and then resurrection that he did it for you. Let's put that on one side. All right, on the other side, let's put how you act every day. 
does it balance? Does your life on a daily basis balance out with this calling that God has put on your life? That's what Paul is begging to be true of you. He says, I'm a prisoner to this calling. I'm not asking you to do anything that I'm not willing to do. Balance the scales. Can someone look at your life every day and see Jesus? We've often said the measure of worship on Sunday is how it's practiced on Monday. Amen? Does it affect your life the rest of the week? Can people see Jesus in you? Is your scale balanced? Does your life reflect the calling that has been placed on it? Matthew 5, 16 says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Is God being glorified by Jesus being visible in your daily life? That is being faithful to holy living. I had a thought uh, in our early service I shared with uh, the congregation at 8 o'clock that as I was driving to church this morning and, and praying through the message and, and, and conditioning my heart and mind to preach on holiness, it dawned on me. My wife and, and seven other members of our church just got back late Tuesday night from six days in the Dominican Republic on a mission trip. Very successful trip. They had a great time and, and served as the hands and feet of Jesus. But here's, what, here's the thought that came to my mind this morning as I was driving here. Everywhere they went while they were in the Dominican Republic, people knew there was something different about them. In fact, here's how they would explain that difference. Those people are not from here. There's something different about them. Should that not be what the world is saying about us every single day? Those people aren't from here. You're right, our citizenship is in heaven. It's not of this world. Our actions, our thoughts, our words should follow that representation can people see Jesus in us? Does the, uh, the expression of our faith cause us to stand out in the culture, the godless culture that we live in? We had a discussion a couple of weeks ago in our men's Bible study that we have every Wednesday morning at 7 a.m. Uh, just through those doors. Uh, what we talked about is how uh, there are a lot of people who have put a lot of effort in trying to figure out how much from the old life they can drag into the new life in Christ and still make acceptable. That's not holy living. Holy living is crucifying that old life and striving to live this new life set apart from the world, which is the definition of holiness. So I want to look at three aspects of, holy, of our pursuit of holiness this morning. There is a standard that must be upheld, and that standard is Jesus. There is a sanctification process that must be daily participated in, and there is sin that must be dealt with. Uh, so let's first look at the standard. Too many Christians today want the security and the comfort and the blessings and the promises of the gospel without the responsibility of conforming to its standard. Sacrificing uh, the old self, crucifying the old self, and living in this new nature that we have received from Jesus Christ. When we trust in Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, we become members, citizens of his kingdom and members of his family. And there's a new identity that goes along with that citizenship and that family membership. Uh, the Lord expects us to act like the new persons that we have become. He expects his standard to become our standard. His purposes to become our purposes. His desires to become our desires. His nature has become our nature. And that becomes evident on the outside just as it is on the inside. Philippians 1.27, the Apostle Paul says, Only let your conduct be worthy, be balanced with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit and with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. This standard that we're speaking of, we find it in the Bible. It is impossible to live a faithful Christian life without knowing what the Bible says. Because the Bible is the instructions for that life. And so... It stands true that the more you know about the Bible, the more you're able to pursue holiness because you know what's expected of you. Uh, that's our reasonable service. It says in, in Romans 12, 
Verses 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now I tell you, and and I'm going to speak more about this in a moment when we talk about sanctification, but it would be easy, and for some people very tempting, to state that my standing before God has been perfectly satisfied by Jesus' holiness. If you don't understand what I mean by that, when, uh, when a person is born again, when a person is truly saved, by the work that Jesus Christ did on the cross, there is an exchange that happens. Jesus takes the sin along with the debt that is owed to that sin that you deserve, which is wrath and eternal separation and condemnation from a holy, righteous God. He takes that out of your account. He satisfies it, but then he gives you his holiness so that you can stand accepted in God's presence. Amen? That is the great exchange that happens in salvation. Okay, well, if that's true, and I now stand in perfect standing with God, that's what propitiation means, that's what righteousness means. It means right standing before God. If I now am in right standing before God because of what Jesus has done, then there could be a temptation to say, well, then I'm free to live however I want to live. Right? Here's the problem with that. If you have the desire to live according to this world, then the holy, the imputing of holiness has not happened. Because if you have Christ's holiness placed in your account, it's going to come out. It's going to come out through repentance. It's going to come out through obedience. It's going to come out all those things we listed last week that give us an assurance of salvation. Go to Romans chapter 6. That entire chapter uh, is about what I just stated of of there will be evidence. You will no longer live in sin if Christ's holiness has been placed in you and you've been set free from the penalty of sin. Romans 6 verse 1. I'm going to read down to verse 6. It says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. There's that walk worthy of the calling. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, That our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. So scripture teaches that if you do not reflect Christ's holiness, you do not have Christ's holiness. It's that simple. There will be an outward evidence of an inward transformation if that inward transformation has happened. Leviticus 19.2 places the, the expectation to rise to the standard that says, Speak to all the congregation of the children of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy. You shall be set apart. You shall be separate from this world, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Hebrews 12.14, Pursue peace with all people and pursue holiness without which no one will see the Lord. And 1 Peter 1, as Peter quotes from Leviticus, uh, in in 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16, but as he who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, 
because it is written, be holy for I am holy. If you think about it, it it only makes sense that if we represent Christ, that we strive to look like Christ, right? Because what what does the word Christian mean? It means Christ-like. So guess what you're doing when you call yourself a Christian? You are telling the world around you, watch me, and I'll show you what Jesus looks like. So holy living is expected. Living a life that is set apart from the world that we're surrounded by. Not only is there a standard to uphold, there's also a lifelong process to participate in. And it's called sanctification. The, the, the daily process of becoming less like the world and more like Jesus. And, and how many of you can testify it is a process? Amen? Uh, we, we are, uh, praise God, or, or we, how, how does it go? We, we are not where we ought to be, but praise God, we ain't where we used to be. So there's a daily process of being transformed and conformed into the image of Jesus. That process should be continually happening. That's an evidence of salvation. Am I more like Jesus today than I was the day I got saved? We talked a, a while uh, we talked last week about one of the evidences of true salvation is not a past decision. It's right now in my life. Can I see Jesus at work in my life? Am I being molded into his image? This is a process that begins the day that you are saved by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit and the work of Jesus on the cross, and it ends the day you're with him in heaven when you're fully perfected. Every day between that, we are constantly being molded into the image of Jesus, less like the world, more like him. I just read Hebrews 12, 14, the word holiness in that verse is translated elsewhere as sanctification, both having the meaning of being set apart, being made separate. Uh, Sanctification, the process of being freed from the power of sin on a daily basis, transformed into godliness. It's God's work in us, transforming us into who he wants us to be. Less like the world, more like his son. 2 Corinthians 7, 1 says, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So this process, where where does it begin? Where does it take us? How are we participating in it? Uh, It is true that I am justified by faith alone in the work of Christ alone. It is his righteousness, it is his perfection, it is his keeping of the law, it is his holiness that gets me in right standing with God, not my own. It says in 2 Timothy 1.9 uh, that uh, he has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. We are accepted in God's kingdom because of the perfect holiness of Christ placed in our account. Hebrews 10, 14 says, by one offering, Jesus has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. So we're not doing this to gain right standing. We're doing this to give evidence that we have right standing in front of God. There's a daily visible evidence of being in that relationship. James 2.17 puts it in the negative, uh, saying if you are justified, if you do have Jesus' holiness, if you are in right standing, there will be works that prove that. Uh, Thus also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, that faith is dead. A profession to know Jesus that is not paired with a lifestyle of becoming like Jesus is an empty profession. We have to be growing in our holiness. And as we pursue holiness, that brings us to the last point I want to make this morning, there has to be a proper dealing with sin. You cannot pursue holiness in a world full of sin without daily dying to that sin, crucifying its passions and desires, getting rid of it, Uh, pursuing holiness and dealing with sin. Sin is something that you will battle with every single day of the sanctification process. The day of becoming more like, uh, process of becoming more like Jesus and less like the world. But I want to tell you something about sin because 
Uh, we, we have done something in Christianity today that I would imagine is highly offensive to God, and that is that we've placed sins in categories where we've made some of them acceptable and we've made some of them unacceptable. We've made some of them big and we've made some of them small. And just the very thought of that, every one of them put Jesus on the cross. Every one of them is deserving of death and eternal separation from a holy God. I think that's a big deal. And so here's how sin should be treated in our pursuit of holiness. It ought to be treated like cancer. So let me ask you, if any of you were diagnosed today with cancer, and let's say it was a small cancer, and it was only in a one isolated area of your body, would you say, oh, it's small and it's limited in its capacity and how much of me it affects, so I'm just going to leave it sitting over there and not pay it any attention? That's absurd. Cancer is never satisfied with how much of you it consumes, and it will kill you. So what do you do? You attack it with everything you've got to get rid of it. You are not content with it being present at all, regardless of how big or small it is, regardless of how drastic the symptoms are. No, you learned that it was there, you do everything to get rid of it. Is not sin the same way? It is never satisfied with how much of you it consumes. You think you can manage sin, it will always wind up managing you you got to get rid of it. You cannot let it sit dormant over here thinking that that's the only area of your life it'll affect and I can keep it hidden. You will never be able to keep it hidden. Sin can no longer be okay. We can no longer be passive to things that are not characteristic of Christ's likeness. It has no place to take up residence in the life of a believer. It should not be tolerated, toyed with, or left untreated. And we should distance ourselves from its temptation. I think of, in my mind, when I think about holiness and how that drives me to repentance, to a proper dealing of sin in my life, that there is a line. And this line is between godliness and worldliness. Holiness, y'all hear me in this, because there's some stubborn people in this room, amen? Amen. The people who said amen were nudging the people beside them. Okay, so let me tell you this. Holiness, and please hear, if you don't hear anything else, is not seeing how close we can get to that line without crossing it. Holiness is getting as far away from that line as possible. If I know that right over here is where temptation is, and one step over that line is sin, then I'm going to live my life over here, honoring to the Lord. Don't get anywhere near it. You will stumble. When we tell our children, don't don't get near that fire, it'll burn you. We're not meaning by that. See how close you can get until it burns you. Although their rebellious heart drives them to do so. When we tell our children not to play in the street because it is dangerous and they could die, we're not encouraging them to go play on the white line. Why? Because... The white line is dangerous too. We know that they are increasing the chances of injury, of casualty. So why do we treat sin that way? We see how close we can get to it. And it goes back to what I talked about just a moment ago. We see how much of the old life we can still fit into the new. That's not holiness. Holiness is getting as far away from it as possible. Not seeing how much I can still look like the world, but but still serve Jesus. We get away from it. Surrounding our life and surrendering our life to Jesus Christ does not mean that my life is free from sin. Sin is a battle, a very fierce battle, but it has to remain a battle. It has to remain a fight. Before Christ came into my life, it wasn't a battle. It was an identity. I embraced that identity. Now that Jesus is my identity, sin is no longer acceptable. It is not okay to be okay with sin any longer, of any size or of any kind. We have to get rid of it. That's what repentance is. The standard is Jesus. The the goal is holiness. 
if you have, if you tolerate anything less than the standard, you'll become complacent with living a substandard life and having a substandard walk, and your scale will not be balanced with the calling. We read Romans 6. Uh, the last verse that we read was verse 6 that says, If we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should live no longer as slaves of sin. We have died to the penalty of sin. We are daily dying to the power of sin. And it's a process, fighting to eradicate it. It's why we must continually and consistently put it to death. Uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, he, does, he has to do this daily. Crucify the flesh daily. I die daily. He says in Colossians 3, 5, Therefore put to death the members which are on the earth. Crucify them. Since your citizenship is not of this world, your actions shouldn't be either. Uh, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Had a pastor say a long time ago, and it was, it was so impactful to me. I've, I've thought of it often. I've used it often. And that is that every day there are two things that fight in me. The spirit and the flesh. The one that's going to win today is the one I feed. You know, it's the one that I show attention to. We cannot be okay with sin any longer. So just reiterating questions I've already asked you, I want you to just ask them to yourself this morning. If I profess to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, meaning, and this is what this means, I believe that the work that Jesus did on the cross was to pay the price for sins that he did not commit. They were sins I committed. He satisfied a wrath that was due to me so that I don't have to pay that consequence. He died a death that I was supposed to die and stay eternally separated from God. And he rose again so that I could have eternal life with his righteousness, keeping me in right, acceptable standing in front of his Father, God on the throne. If that describes me, it should be visible every day in my life. So we ask ourselves the questions, are my scales balanced? You put the profession of being a Christian on this side. You put my di uh, daily thoughts, words, and actions on this side. Are they balanced? Are they worthy? Not as a way to gain, but as a way to prove that I am a child of God. Does my life reflect the calling that has been placed on it? And can people look at my life every day of the week and see Jesus? That's the thought that I want us walking out of here with today. Can people look at me in my work environment? Can my family look at me at home? Can they look at me at the, the grocery store when I'm responding to an inconvenience? Here, here's something for you, a test of holiness. One of our elders sent this out to us a couple of weeks ago. A test of holiness. How pleasurable are you to disagree with? Think about it. Do you respond in the flesh? Or do you respond in the spirit? How are we reflecting Christ? Is your life consumed with a pursuit of holiness? Obedience, repentance, worship, transformation, forgiveness, confession, all of that's involved in the pursuit of holiness, being made less like the world and more like Jesus. So I want you to bow your heads. I, I want to pray that simple prayer over us that Pastor Vody Balkum says he prays over himself every morning. It's a real easy prayer to pray. Lord, I pray over this congregation right now, specifically for the ones who know Jesus in a personal way. 
They have been transformed by the power of the gospel. That you would make them more like Jesus today than they were yesterday. And that they would look more like him tomorrow than they did today. That will happen as we pursue holiness and obedience and eradicate sin in repentance, striving to be Christ like. We are ambassadors, we represent Jesus. May our lives look like Jesus. And I know there are those here today that do not have a personal relationship with Christ, so obviously their lives are not going to look like His. Uh, I just pray that you would save them, that the work of the cross would become personal, that your Holy Spirit would open their eyes, that they would see Jesus and His work in a way they've never seen it before, realizing it was their sin He was dying for. And it was their relationship He was purchasing that they would place their faith and trust in the work of Jesus on the cross. Dying to sin, no longer to be identified by it, and being raised to walk in a new life in Christ. So once again, my, my prayer for my own life and for those you have given me the awesome opportunity to shepherd is that you would make us more like Jesus today than we were yesterday. And that we would be more like him tomorrow than we will be today. We ask this in Jesus' name.